This is section 11.2, lecture video number two. Okay, so now that we've discussed what a series is and how to talk about it intelligently, let's look at an example. One of the most important examples of infinite series that you'll learn about is something called a geometric series. And we have it listed out here below. So the geometric series looks like A plus A times R plus AR squared plus AR cubed, so on and so forth. So A is some constant that is not zero, because if it's zero, none of this would make any sense or be um, anything to talk about. Um, and you start, I'm sorry, this should say N equals one, not N minus one. A R to the N minus one is the defining term. Again, A is some constant that would be defined for you. And then um, N minus one is your counter. I'm sorry, N is your counter. So, you can see the exponents here start at zero. You can imagine this is a r to the zero, r to the first, r squared, r cubed, and so on. So the way to notate that is n minus one because the very first term doesn't have an r. So we would need that exponent to be zero. So series that look like this are called geometric series where you have a constant times some value raised to an exponent. So each term is ob obtained from the preceding one by multiplying it by the common ratio. R is called a common ratio and when we talk about geometric series. So you can see, for example, AR squared comes from AR times R. AR cubed comes from AR squared times R. AR to the fourth comes from AR cubed times R and so forth. So you can get each term by multiplying the previous one by R. If r equals one, then this is just the addition of a over and over and over again, and that would definitely diverge because it would go to infinity. Um, since the limit of s sub n doesn't exist, the geometric series would diverge in this case uh, because of the fact that this goes towards infinity. If r is not one, then that's something actually interesting to talk about. Um, the partial sum s sub n would be the sum of the first n terms of the series, which would go from a to a r to the n minus one. If you multiply both sides of this equation by r, you get the below formula. So r times s n is all of these values. So a times r plus a r times r plus a r squared times r and so on. Multiply everything by r. And what it looks like you get are the same terms of the series plus one extra on the end, because by multiplying each term by r, you end up with the next term or something that looks like the next term. So this a r to the n is this last term up here multiplied by r. This a r here is the first term a multiplied by r, okay? If you subtract these two, s sub n minus r s sub n, and then this right-hand side minus this right hand side, all that you have left after you subtract all these terms is an a and an a r to the n because all of these inside terms subtract out to zero. Lastly, if you factor out an s sub n and divide both sides by one minus r, then you have an expression, which is really cool, that represents the partial sum for any value n. So now you don't have to sit there on your calculator and add up a bunch of terms. If I say, here's the value of a, here's the value of r, what's the partial sum when n is four? You can tell me immediately without doing any manual work. So you will not be deriving this type of value very often, but we just wanted to show you how, where this one comes from because it's so common. And the geometric series is, like I said, one of the most common series we'll talk about. Now, in between, what if r is between negative one and one? We already know from section 11.1 .1 that r to the n goes to zero when r is between negative one and one as n approaches infinity. So the limit of the partial sums, s sub n, would be the limit of this expression that we just found on the last page. And if you split that up into two pieces, we would have a over one minus r, minus a over one minus r times a limit, which ends up just being a over 
one minus r because the limit of r to the n is zero. So this whole second term completely goes away. And notice that this comes from multiplying the a back out, a times one minus a times r n, and then splitting that into two fractions is where these two terms come from. So when the absolute value of r is less than one, which is the same thing as what this expression says, this series, this geometric series is convergent. And the sum is a over one minus r, or the limit, whichever way you want to think about that. If r is less than or equal to negative one, or greater than positive one, the sequence itself is divergent, and thus the limit of the partial sums does not exist. And again, thus the geometric series diverges in the cases where r is less than or equal to negative one, or greater than one. To summarize these results, if we start with this geometric series, that series is convergent if r is between negative one and one, but anywhere else, it's divergent. And our last example is another very popular slash common um, series, and it's called a harmonic series. It's a little bit simpler to think about. It's simply the sum of one over n. Again, this is supposed to be an equal sign. I'm sorry. I'm not sure why that didn't translate when I wrote this part of the PowerPoint deck. Um, anyway, that's the sum of one over n from n equals one to infinity. So when n is one, that's one over one. When n is two, that's one over two, one over three, one over four, and so on. So this example says show that it's divergent, which to be honest with you is not super obvious because even though the first value is one, every value after it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So your gut would think this must converge to some value. So let's take a look. Uh, for this series, it's actually really handy to look at specific partial sums. 2, 4, 8, 16, and 32, and so forth, powers of 2, and show that they become larger and larger and larger. So for example, S2, the second partial sum, would be the sum of the first two terms, so that's 1 plus 1 half. The fourth partial sum, S4, would be the sum of the first four terms, which is 1 plus 1 half plus 1 third plus 1 fourth. Now, from the left-hand side here to the right-hand side with this inequality is simply changing this one-third to a one-fourth to show you that this left-hand side is greater than this right-hand side. And that's true because one-third is greater than one-fourth. Why does this matter? Because then we can show that S4 is larger than two. S8 is the sum of the first eight terms. And just like in the last one with S4, I can do a comparison where I change both of these to be one fourth and all four of these to be one eighth, which makes them all smaller, which means S8 is bigger than this value. What is this value? Two and a half. If we do the same idea with S16, and don't worry too much about how they got this idea, you won't have to replicate this. If, but if we do the same idea with S16, we can show that S16 is definitely larger than three, or one plus two. So we're not seeing a pattern, if that makes sense. We're constantly showing that a partial sum is larger than a value that continues to increase. So when is it gonna slow down? Well, the answer is that it's not. We can similarly show that the 32nd partial sum is greater than one plus five over two, and the 64th partial sum is greater than one plus six over two, which means as you get larger and larger values of two, or larger and larger values of n, s sub two to the n is always gonna be greater than one plus n over two, because s 32, that's s sub two to the fifth, 64 is two to the sixth, and so on. So we found this pattern that shows as your partial sums move down the line, you can always show that it's larger than some value that's not converging, which proves that these partial sums are not converging. In fact, they're diverging to infinity as n approaches infinity, and thus the partial sums themselves must be divergent. So the harmonic series diverges. 
So this one is really interesting because like I said, when you first look at the question, it seems like, it seems like this should definitely converge, but we can pretty quickly show, hopefully this made sense. We can pretty quickly show that no matter what partial sum we're working on, it continues to grow. Okay, um, a theorem. If we have a convergence series, then the limit of that sequence is zero. The converse is not true. If you have a sequence where the limit is zero, you can't say anything about the series, the sum of those terms. But if you know the series is con convergent, then definitely that means the limit of your sequence is zero. So make sure you don't accidentally use this um, backwards. It's only true one way. All right, uh, our next item is the test for divergence. If the limit of a sequence does not exist or is not zero, then that series is divergent. Remember, a to the n by itself is the sequence. The sum of a to the n is the series. So if you know the limit of the sequence doesn't exist or is non-zero, then we know for sure that the series is divergent. Okay, um, if you have two convergent series, then there's some things you can say about adding, subtracting, and multiple um, multiplying, just like we've seen with every single uh, section where we talk about limits. So if you have the sum of two sequences, you can split that up into two sums. Same thing with the difference. Constants can be pulled out front of sums and so on. I think all of these are gonna be pretty um, familiar to you guys from limits. And that is the end of section 11.2. If you made it all the way the, to the end of this video, congratulations. Give it a thumbs up so I know you guys are watching.